Hello, good afternoon. My name is Dominic Nardi, and I cover religious freedom issues in China for the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, or USERF. For those of you not aware, USERF is an independent government body created more than 20 years ago by the International Religious Freedom Act of 1998, also known as IRFA. Our mandate is to monitor religious freedom abroad and to make policy recommendations to the President, the Secretary of State, and Congress. Our work is led by nine commissioners appointed by the President and the Republican and Democratic leaders of the House of Representatives and the Senate. Today's event is special for two reasons. First, it provides us with a chance to highlight the Chinese government's persecution of Tibetan Buddhists and to discuss the steps that our government should take to protect Tibet's unique religious heritage. Second, this is an opportunity for you, sir, to reflect on our past as well as our future. Today I'm joined by one of our former chairs, Dr. Tenzin Dorji, and by one of our newest commissioners, Nuri Turkel. Both have been tireless champions on behalf of religious freedom in China. We'll have a chance for you all in the audience to ask questions, uh, so please feel free to submit them at any time through the question and answer function on Zoom. Dr. Tenzin Dorji received his doctorate in inter intercultural communication from UC Santa Barbara and is an associate professor at the Department of Human Communication Studies, California State University, Fullerton. Tenzin was appointed to USERF on December 8th, 2016 by then House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi. He was reappointed in May 2018, and a month later he was unanimously elected chair of the commission. Tenzin is the first Tibetan American to have served on the commission. With that said, it's my pleasure to turn the event over to Tenzin. Uh, thank you, Dominic, and uh, many congratulations to Commissioner Turco. Uh, this is the first time I'm meeting you through mediated communication. And hello to all my colleagues at USER and everyone who are plugged into this uh, conversation today. And uh, uh, as I mean, most of you know that when it comes to religious freedom conditions around the world, uh, Communist China is the worst among uh, CPC countries or country of particular concern. USER in our annual reports for years continuously have uh, recommended uh, you know, China for CBC designation and administration has always uh, you know, done that. And uh, so today our conversation is focused on uh, religious freedom conditions in Tibet. And uh, uh, you know, because of uh, uh, the speaker and leader Pelosi's uh, nomination, uh, I served on the use of uh, for four years uh, advancing religious freedom around the world and in particular with regard to China, all over China and Tibet. Uh, so when it comes to Tibet, uh, of course there are many uh, things we can talk about, uh, uh, but I can only focus on a few things uh, in a couple of minutes. And uh, first I want to really focus on to how China really uh, through uh, new rules and regulations, they have tried to control the reincarnation of uh, Tibetan Buddhist uh, masters including His Holiness uh, the Dalai Lama. And as you know, today is uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama's uh, 85th birthday. And it's very befitting to start off conversation about that. And um, uh, I also want to thank, uh, you know, Ambassador of US to India, uh, you know, Kenneth uh, Jester uh, for his wonderful video message uh, of happy birthday wishes to His Holiness and support for Tibetan cause uh, on behalf of the United States of America. Yeah. Uh, and um, so in Tibetan Buddhism, uh, one of the unique features is uh, that we believe uh, many of these holy beings, uh, such as uh, the Dalai Lama and the Panchen Lama, uh, they can decide to come back in different forms. And the present Dalai Lama is the 14th in the line. The institution of Dalai Lama started in the 14th century. You know, it has been unbroken uh, for all these centuries. And as you know, that in the case of the Panchen Lama, who is the second uh, highest Buddhist leader in Tibet, uh, uh, because he, uh, the 10th Panchen Lama passed uh, away in the Tibet under very difficult situations, uh, and his reincarnation was born in Tibet. As soon as his son, the Dalai Lama recognized Panchen Gintun Shigin Yima as uh, the 
uh, 11 Benjamin Lama, uh, Communist China has disappeared uh, uh, him and uh, you know, his uh, you know, family uh, you know, at, at a very young age, when he was about uh, five years old. And since then, we have no information about uh, his well-being. And China keeps on saying that he's fine. He doesn't want to be disturbed by the world. Uh, but I have always advocated uh, for China to say, at least you should uh, you know, show the videographic evidence of uh, that he is fine. And they said he graduated from university and he must be working, right? So please show that to the world so that at least we feel a little better about uh, his uh, condition. So the reason why you know, they try to control reincarnation system is because they know uh, the reincarnations of Panchen Lama and the Dalai Lama are so vital to uh, you know, Tibetan Buddhists. You know? And uh, so they you know, know that his son Dalai Lama is in advanced age now. And uh, so they prepared that through order number five and other regulations uh, that they will choose the next Dalai Lama just like they did for uh, Panchen Lama. But uh, as I have said this many times, emphatically as much as I can, with full confidence, you cannot do that because his son, the Dalai Lama, is in freedom, in exile. And uh, you know, he always wants to resolve Tibet-China issue non-violently through middle way approaches, and he wants to go back. Uh, but if this doesn't get resolved, his reincarnation will be in free country. He's not going to be in your control. Obviously, there will be two Dalai Lamas, the one the Tibetans recognize and won by the China, but the world will only recognize and respect and accept the Tibetan uh, you know, uh, you know, candidate. Uh, so that's uh, one issue that I have uh, raised uh, on many occasions uh, 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 that uh, you know, we should all pay attention. And uh, I'm also thankful particularly to Ambassador at large, uh, Sam Brownback, who traveled all the way to India, Dharamsala, uh, and met with his son Dalai Lama and he wanted to internationalize it uh, so that the whole world will be behind Tibetan people. It, it comes to choosing your spiritual leader. Every faith group should have the right to choose the leader they wanted it, right? And Communist China is uh, uh, you know, a system with no religious faith, so they have no right whatsoever to uh, mess up with or interfere in the Tibetan reincarnation system. The second issue that I want to raise is uh, you know, because the USA has uh, this special project called uh, Prisoners of Conscience, POC. And I have advocated uh, for uh, at least two uh, prisoners of conscience in China, Gulmera Imen from Uyghur, East Turkestan, or we call Xinjiang, and the Penchen Lama among thousands in Tibet. You know, and on any given occasion, when we have POC special events in Washington, DC, uh, the good old days when we could all be together face to face, uh, and I advocated for their release. Uh, uh, and, but even, you know, and on his birthdays, I have sent special messages, press release, and I have done anything I could in congressional hearings about uh, religious freedom condition in China, and especially in Tibet. Uh, despite all of our efforts, uh, you know, China has been very stubborn, has not even showed us, uh, and given us even basic information or videographic evidence of, uh, you know, his, uh, you know, well-being. And uh, so I hope uh, uh, that, uh, and I do not only hope, but I do believe that USA will continue to make efforts uh, to uh, free uh, the, you know, the pension Lama. Uh, and uh, the other things, as we know that, uh, you know, China has, uh, you know, destroyed uh, many of the Tibetan Buddhist monasteries, and these are really centers of learning. Tibetan monasteries are usually not centers for praying and rituals. You know, these are our universities. And the most famous cases are the Larunga Monastery and Yachinka, uh, which were you know, destroyed in half. Uh, and uh, so that is a huge evidence why there is no religious freedom uh, you know, in Tibet. And uh, the other issues is that uh, you know, China is standardizing the religious faiths. It's not only Tibetan Buddhist, Christianity, Islamic, and other faiths. And that is a very dangerous matter. They wanted you to rewrite the Bible, rewrite the Dhammapada, rewrite uh, the Quran, I think. And that is like a serious, serious violations. And uh, so we cannot uh, accept what China's are trying to do. And we must uh, make concerted effort to stop uh, sinicizing, uh, you know, religious faiths and so forth. And the next issue, uh, I know I have only a couple of minutes uh, that we want to talk about is, uh, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, China used the state-of-the-art technology uh, to control 
uh, people in China, especially you know, among the minorities, identify Uyghurs and Tibetans. You know, they have been collecting, uh, you know, uh, social demographic information, uh, and uh, so they really micromanage uh, the lives of uh, the Uyghurs and Tibetans' other faith systems. Tibetan monasteries are highly, you know, surveillanced, and uh, you know, the administrators are maintained by uh, the you know Chinese uh, members of Chinese Communist Party. In Tibetan Buddhist tradition, uh, as the Dalai Lama has always said it's not enough to follow you know, your uh, religion by faith. That becomes a blind faith. You must study thoroughly. As Buddha himself said, investigate my teaching. When you are convinced, follow it. Don't accept it out of like, faith in me. So we really need to do years of systematic rigorous studies in our Tibetan monastery. And that's being done in exile in India. Uh, but that is not available in Tibet because of Chinese micromanagement. And they use the religion to fulfill their uh, political, you know, ideology and, uh, you know, uh, things like that. Uh, and um, so, uh, you know, in my case, as I said, you know, I should have said this at the beginning, but I kept it here just to, in a conclusion, you remember it better, that I was born in Tibet. And uh, so Tibet, uh, when India was under British rule, uh, India won independence in 47, I'm contexting it for you, Tibet was still an independent country. And after 1959, uh, we lost our country, and his son the Dalai Lama, and thousands of Tibetans escaped to the neighboring country, especially India. And my parents escaped uh, over the Himalayas to India, and I was just smuggled out as an infant. I pretty much grew up in the Tibetan refugee communities. I had the best of education in Tibetan traditions and modern education. I come much later, came at uh, to the United States, and I did my uh, PhD at UC Santa Barbara. And then I had the privilege and honor to serve on use uh, and not only work for the religious freedom in Tibet and China, but throughout the world. So that was, I call as a Buddhist, my great karma, you know. Uh, and I still really uh, support and continue uh, this, uh, you know, in my individual and personal, uh, you know, uh, capacity. And uh, so some of the things that I have accomplished during my time, just a minute, uh, is that, uh, I, you know, I worked hard uh, for, uh, to advocate for the Reciprocal Access to Tibet Act, which has been passed successfully. And under this act, uh, that as much as, uh, you know, Chinese students, scholars, businessmen are able to come to China and do whatever they like, as long as they get a visa and freedom, you know, we should have the same right to go back to China and Tibet. You know, as you might know, that uh, you might get a visa to China, but when it comes to Tibet, you know, they have special restrictions and you need special permit. And somebody like me, Tibetan American, they know my name is Tibetan, right, Tenzin, and uh, they're more likely to reject me. And that is not uh, fair. You know, we let you, I'm an American, I let you come to my country, and you should let me come back to my heritage country. That's a fair game. If not, uh, I strongly urge the US administration to put all the sanctions, uh, uh, you know, based upon uh, uh, the Reciprocal Access to Tibet Act and Tibet Policy Act of 2002, uh, as well as the Global Magnitsky and Accountability Act. So that's what I would like to say. And I also, you know, uh, advocated for Tibet Policy and Support Act. And I appeared in the congressional hearings uh, on the Tibet and China Research Freedom. And I did what I could so within four years, uh, you know, to make some difference uh, uh, in the lives of Tibetans to research freedom in Tibet. Uh, so with that, I will yield back to you, Dominic. Thank you, Tenzin. And, um... You know, I think it's, I think, I think you really did make a difference, which, um, you know, we're all, I think I speak for the whole commission when I say, you know, we're all proud of your service and we all miss your wisdom. Um, I can say for our viewers out there that USERF does continue to advocate on behalf of the Panchen Lama and Gulmira Amin, uh, even though Tenzin has, is no longer with the commission. So next up um, is Commissioner Nuri Turco. Nuri received a law degree and a master's in international affairs from American University. In 2003, he co-founded the Uyghur Human Rights Project and he served as president of the Uyghur American Association. In May 2020, Speaker Pelosi appointed him to fill the vacancy left by Tenzin at Husserf. He is the first Uyghur American to serve on the commission. With that, it's my pleasure to yield the floor to Mary. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dominique. Um, I'm so delighted to be um, uh, able to uh, uh, speak with you and um, former USERF chair, uh, Dr. Uh, Tenzin Dorji. 
uh, I, I like to take this opportunity to thank the staff for organizing uh, today's important conversation. Um, when uh, Dr. Dorji was appointed as a use of commissioner, the Uyghur community was very excited uh, that a, a, a former uh, political refugee, um, uh, now American citizen, can make it to the, such a important uh, position to represent the United States on uh, religious freedom. Um, and during his um, tenure, um, we also seen uh, Dr. Dorji uh, showing a true leadership, um, including uh, last year's uh, 2019 th um, uh, annual report showing the Uyghur uh, flag mask. That has also uh, provided some hope for the Uyghur people that the United States government start paying attention. So with that, I'd like to ho I, I hope to return a favor by being a voice on, on the Commission for Tibetan Buddhists and other uh, embattled uh, religious communities in China. Um, I have an interesting history as uh, Dr. Dorji as well. I was born uh, in uh, China's controlled East Turkestan uh, that the authorities call the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. Um, I was born in a re-education camp, oddly enough, uh, during the height of the cult China's Cultural Revolution. I came to the United States in 1995 uh, as a student. Uh, two years later, I was granted asylum. Um, I have been focusing on primarily in Uyghur human rights, but I had the pleasure to meet and make a friend with my Tibetan brothers and sisters who've been fighting for Tibetan freedom uh, uh, for a long time. My first interaction with the Tibetan community was when um, uh, late leader uh, Lodi Geri uh, invited me and a few other Uyghur friends for lunch uh, where he shared his with them and experience um, working through the United States government to advocate uh, human rights for the Tibetan people. Uh, and also because of that connection, we, uh, we also get access to the uh, professional staff at the International Campaign for Tibet, uh, including um, Ambassador Kelly Curry, uh, Bujing Tsering, uh, who I whom I consider as a brother. Uh, we always, uh, we have been speaking at same, same events and uh, in the regular contact. And also um, I have been um, uh, pleased that uh, when uh, I co-founded the, uh, co the Uyghur Human Rights Project 17 years ago, um, the I ICT leadership also uh, supported the NED, uh, our primary grantee, uh, 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 pr primary uh, uh, organization providing grants to support the initiative. So I, I am profoundly grateful uh, for the uh, organizations uh, representing the Tibetan community and also leadership for the friendship uh, and support that, they, that it has shown uh, over the years. The Chinese government not only implements a similar type of repressive policies in East Turkestan and Tibet, they also um, recycle uh, its communist leadership. Um, case in point, uh, this person by the name Chen, Chen, Chen Chenguo, who has been in the news a lot uh, in the last two, three years, was um, a ruling Tibet uh, with heavy fist uh, before he got promoted to become a, a Communist Party chief in the Xinjiang government. After he, uh, before he was moving to Xinjiang, he introduced a mass surveillance system in Tibet an intensified campaign to forcibly assimilate uh, Tibetan Buddhists. Um, as uh, Dr. Darji, Dorji was mentioning, um, getting information from Tibet uh, and local contacts uh, has been so difficult. Um, ironically, uh, the journalists have much free access to war zones like, the, like Syria, then Tibet and East Turkestan to provide actual uh, information on what's happening to the Uyghur people and Tibetan people. Um, and I also agree with, uh, I wholeheartedly agree with Dr. Dorji that where uh, the Chinese citizens, uh, government officials, uh, media representatives, academics could come to the United States freely and they can uh, engage in whatever the activities that they're interested uh, freely, whereas 
the uh, American journalists, American officials, American citizens cannot do the same thing. Um, the 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 uh, the ongoing uh, repression in both uh, Tibet and East Turkestan uh, must be investigated through a journalistic work and NGO uh, investigation and academic research. Um, since I joined the USERF, um, I have been focusing not only on the Uyghur issues, also uh, focusing on Tibetan Buddhist uh, uh, struggle. Um, in 2018, uh, the Chinese government uh, adopted a nationwide anti-gang crime campaign. Uh, uh, the uh, authorities in Tibet are citing this campaign as justification to crack down on non-criminal advocacy work by Tibetan Buddhists, just the same way that the Xinjiang government claiming that they are committing um, uh, modern day, uh, uh, building modern day concentration camps to fight against extremism. According to Human Rights Watch, courts in Tibet areas have sentenced at least 51 Tibetans to prison under anti-gang charges for peacefully petitioning or protesting issues relating to religion, environmental protection, land rights, and corruption. Authorities have also cited anti-gang campaign to search homes for photographs of uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. The Chinese government has increased restriction on Tibetan monasteries uh, to point where they have a little meaningful independence. Local authorities appoint Communist Party members to, man to the management boards of Buddhist monasteries the government has used its power to excel clergy to destroy monastic facilities. During the past few years, the government expelled thousands of monks and nuns from the famous Loringar complex in Sichuan province. According to RFA, last summer, 7,000 were expelled from the Yachingar Tibetan Buddhist Center before the government raised nearly half of the sprawling uh, complex. Those monks and nuns who remained were forced to take patriotic re-education classes, much like the one that is taking place in the Uyghur region. The Chinese government refuses to see these houses of worship and other religious sites as living, breathing symbols of faith. I wholeheartedly agree with uh, uh, Ambassador Brombeck that uh, Chinese government is on war on faith in China. USERF is closely tracking the Chinese government's use of technology to oppress religious groups. During the past decades, it has installed, um, the Chinese government installed hundreds of millions of surveillance cameras across the country, particularly in Tibet and the Uyghur region. Local authorities have surveillance, had surveillance cam cameras installed outside and inside of Tibetan monasteries so they can track who enters uh, into the facilities or places of worship. The government is using artificial intelligence system that can pro reportedly combine information from video surveillance, facial recognition, voice recognition, G uh, GPS tracking, and other data to track, distinguish Uyghur uh, and Tibetans from the other ethnic groups. According to the experts, this is the first time that the government has intentionally used artificial intelligence for racial profiling. You can imagine uh, East German Stasi with AI-powered tools to monitor its citizens. The digital authoritarianism being tested in the Uyghur uh, and Tibetan areas and now actively being promoted to other countries. Uh, last year, New York Times reported at least more than two, uh, three dozen countries have already in the process of adopting China's uh, digital surveillance or surveillance techniques to monitor their own citizens. Um, the biometric sampling uh, is also another concern. Uh, beginning 2013, uh, China's authorities obtained biometric samples from nearly the entire population of the Tibetan Ap Autonomous Region under the guise of free annual physical examinations. This is also has been the case in, the, in East Turkestan. This is part of the planned national DNA database of all China citizens that would amount to an unprecedented invasion of privacy. It's especially troubling that an American company, American scientists uh, like uh, Kenneth Kitt, Professor Kenneth Kitt at Yale University, 
and this uh, Massachusetts-based company called Thermo Fisher Scientific has exported DNA testing kits to China that are designed to distinguish between Han Chinese, Uyghur, and Tibetans. Chinese government also uh, monitor uh, social medias, uh, particularly WeChat, uh, more strictly than that of the lay citizens uh, when it comes to uh, non-Han Chinese uh, uh, citizen uh, individuals, uh, including Tibetans and Uyghurs. Government censors quickly remove posts about sensitive subjects, such as destruction of Tibetan monasteries. Recently, members of the Tibetan WeChat group were jailed for discussing His Holiness the Dalai Lama. This use of, uh, the, this use of technology does not stop at China's borders. According to the Chinese uh, Citizens Lab, hackers have used WhatsApp messages to target the Apple iPhone, uh, iPhones and Android devices of Tibetan and Uyghur activists living abroad. I am particularly uh, pleased in response to, to what is happening uh, in Tibet and East Turkestan in particular. The current administration has done a, a number of, uh, made a number of significant decisions, including uh, blacklisting some entities uh, uh, in China. In October 2019, and again in May 2020, Commerce Department placed dozens of Chinese entities and companies to the entity list that includes Dahua Technologies, Hikvision, Negvi Technologies, and SenseNets, restricting their access to sensitive U.S. technology. These companies have significant indigenous uh, technical capabilities, they also have uh, still rely heavily on advanced microprocessors and key and other key uh, technology from the United States. Commerce Department specifically cited abuses in the Xinjiang uh, area as justification for those actions. But the tools from many other companies also being used in Tibet uh, that need to be uh, paid attention to. Um, but this technology change, uh, changes rapidly, so the United States needs to remain vigilant and adopt its regulation as needed uh, to monitor and, and prevent uh, technology being misused against the Uyghurs and others uh, in China. Uh, in rest, retrospect, in conclusion, I'd like to point out that I've learned from Tibet um, uh, is that the Chinese government oppression will never stay confined to one religious group. What happened to Tibetan Buddhists yesterday is happening to Uyghur Muslims today and will happen to Christians tomorrow. The struggle for religious freedom in China is larger than any single domination or faith group. What I, found, what I have found encouraging is how religious groups seem to understand this. Religious leaders around the, around the world rallied behind Uyghur people when we needed them the most. And thank you very much. I'd be happy to take some questions uh, if you may, uh, that you may have. Definitely, thank you very much. And um, Nuri, again, I, I think I speak for the entire commission when I say we're really excited to have you as part of our team. Um, now, you both have described the scale of the problem facing Tibetan Buddhism and the challenges are, are daunting. So what do we do about this? What can the United States government to do to, to try to promote religious freedom for Tibetan Buddhists? Um, the United States government can do a number of things. To me, I think the train has left the station. I think there should be a, a dramatic change in the approach. Um, I, I don't want to uh, talk about the same thing uh, 10 years, 20 years down the road. Uh, first thing first, uh, to, uh, the United States Congress must pass uh, the uh, legislative initiatives being introduced um, uh, that is currently being considered. Uh, United States government, uh, particularly Congress, has been uh, providing bipartisan, bicameral support to Tibetan Buddhists. Um, that has been the case with the Uyghurs as well. That must continue. Uh, concerning and working on behalf of the Tibetan Buddhists and other religious minorities in China, it's a matter of conscience. It transcends political party uh, ideologies, uh, or even who's occupying the high offices. And also um, the uh, Tibetan Policy Support Act uh, need to be, um, need to be uh, 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 
the, I'd like to highlight the importance of the Tibetan Policy Support Act uh, of 2000 uh, that would update and strengthen the Tibetan Policy Act of 2002. Um, the, the, issue, um, the issue of the targeted sanction um, would be authorized by the Tibetan Policy Support Act. The sanctioning the Chinese uh, officials and entities that are responsible for the ongoing human rights abuses should have been done a long time ago. Um, I, I call on the administration uh, to uh, immediately uh, impose sanction under the global Magnitsky sanction to uh, go after those uh, Chinese officials, entities that have been designing, uh, expanding, implementing the, uh, the apparatus that is oppressing, uh, destroying the Tibetan culture and the Uyghur culture in China. And also, I wanted to thank the, uh, the leadership um, uh, been shown by, uh, uh, shown by both sides of the aisle, uh, including uh, Representative Jim McGovern, Senator Marco Rubio, and I cannot be great, more grateful to uh, Speaker Pelosi, who has been lifelong champion for human rights uh, in China, including those of uh, those, um, including the Tibetan religious freedom and Uyghur human rights. Tenzin, did you have anything to add? Uh, thank you, uh, Dominic. And I you know, completely agree with uh, Commissioner Turkle. Uh, I think the United States of America has done a lot for uh, Tibet, Tibetan people and uh, Tibetan human rights with freedom, uh, but a lot more uh, needs to be done and can be done. And the most urgent one right now is the Tibet Policy and Support Act that is uh, in the Senate. So before this uh, year comes to an end, uh, I very much urge, uh, you, know, uh, you know, to pass that uh, and the president can sign it, uh, just like the Reciprocal Access to Tibet Act. So once we have these acts in place, uh, I would urge the administration uh, to uh, implement these acts uh, so that uh, Chinese will feel the pressure and they need to make uh, the difference. Uh, China is really not yielding to any like nice diplomatic things that we have done. We gave them the most favored nation tra trading status and we goofed on that one. Now we really have to show our uh, tough love. I always make difference between we should love Chinese people. We have nothing against them. What our struggle and fight is against the Chinese communist leadership who is actually oppressing their own people as well, especially Tibetans and Uyghurs. And so therefore I urge the administration to uh, you know, appoint a special coordinator for Tibet, uh, which has been vacant since 2017. You know? 154 Tibetans have uh, self-immolated burn you know, for the religious freedom, human rights, and the return of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And uh, we are going through an unprecedented uh, you know, time right now. And I think United States should also use multilateral international you know, cooperation to, uh, to put pressure on China uh, so that the China will be, become humble. They don't know how to be humble yet. You know, when they're nice to them, it doesn't work. The carrots are not working now. So we have to use the sticks, you know. So I very much, uh, you know, uh, support, uh, you know, all of those things and recommend strongly that. Uh, and I want to really thank, when it comes to Tibet, United States has been a united house. On many other issues, it's open secret. We are very divided house. When it comes to Tibet, both Republicans and Democrats and independents, all of the above <laughs> is the answer that has strongly supported Tibet. That's why the Tibet case has remained very alive and uh, it will succeed. Yeah, I guess I, I just reiterate that and said, um, you know, despite some of the many divisions in our own country, religious freedom is an issue that seems to have been, uh, have, that's united us all. So um, it sounds like the US government has done a lot to support religious freedom in China and Tibet. It also sounds like there's a lot more we can and should be doing. So um, with that said, before I open it up to questions from the audience, is there anything that either of you would like to ask the other? Um, uh, if I may, I'd like to point out something uh, very important, uh, which is um, uh, our government, our Congress is very good at making laws, but if the law is not implemented, it, literally meaningless. 
Um, I am very disappointed uh, that uh, the special coordinator for Tibetan issue position has been vacant since uh, January 2017. Um, that office is an important office. That position is an important position. I call, I urge the administration uh, to fill in that vacancy as soon as possible so that we will have a leader every day um, this, at the State Department leading the effort uh, to champion for religious freedom in Tibet. And number one, this is also the, the, the fact that this office has been vacant, uh, this position has been vacant, also affected uh, the, the similar position proposed in the Uyghur bill, the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act. Uh, some members of Congress, uh, some staffers, uh, and even some diplomats think that it's not really necessary um, because this position has been uh, vacant. So um, this also set a bad example uh, when the Congress is considering the uh, Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act. Um, it's, it's more than just a symbolic position. Uh, it's very substantive position. When they created this, um, when uh, Greg Craig was leading this office, uh, holding this, this position, it was very effective. And others uh, followed the suit. So we should, uh, we should have somebody um, appointed as soon as possible. And also, um, I, you know, during the work, um, uh, during my advocacy work in the last two, three years, since the, um, the concentration, the news about concentration camp, uh, camps surfaced, I've been somewhat dumbfounded that um, the uh, European countries, uh, particularly EU as an entity, have been uh, silent. Uh, they also have been relatively lukewarm in their response to the ongoing repression in Tibet. Um, the tackling uh, human rights in China requires more than one country. Uh, addressing the human rights concerns, uh, taking a bold, uh, tangible uh, steps uh, should not be only the matter for the United States government. So I'm using this opportunity to call on uh, democratic nations uh, or countries that value human rights, uh, value religious freedom to uh, uh, speak out. And, and if I can be more direct, get on the right side of the history. Yeah, agreed. Uh, any, any, so any, um, any other questions or anything to touch on before we open up to the audience? Yes, I, you know, I'd like to take, take advantage of this opportunity to ask um, uh, Dr. Dorji if he has any um, recommendations, advice for me to be effective in this position. Uh, I think it's very humbling to hear you ask me that. I don't think uh, really I am in a position to be able to advise you anything. Uh, you have much experience. Our backgrounds are similar. I think we both, uh, <clears throat> I was born under Chinese communists and you were born in a concentration camp. So we have uh, lived experience and we have seen what's been through. So that should give us all the strength and direction. That's how I functioned uh, uh, in the last four years uh, while serving on uh, the US commission. And uh, so I think uh, <clears throat> there's nothing I can advise you, but uh, <clears throat> you know, I would like you to, I mean, just like you said, uh, uh, you know, make every effort you have uh, to uh, have the administration implement, you know, at least some of uh, the provisions under those acts, whether it is the Uyghur Human Rights Act or whether it's the Tibet, uh, uh, you know, Policy and Support Act uh, that really need to be passed soon and the Reciprocal Access to Tibet Act. And I really appreciate you calling strongly for the appointment of a special coordinator for Tibet, you know. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great. Well, I have a feeling uh, Nuri might be calling upon Tenzin in the future for advice as uh, he continues his work on the commission. Um, all right, so let's open it to audience questions. And let's, let me just take a look to see um, what we have. All right, so here's, here's one question. Um, we criticize China a lot in our reports and you serve. How does the Chinese government respond? Have they responded? Um, <clears throat> Chinese government has a habit of uh, playing whataboutism um, and uh, uh, claiming that the United States is interfering in China's internal affairs. 
if they wanted to have a healthy relationship, uh, mutually respectful relationship uh, with the rest of the world, they need to stop um, uh, denying something so obvious. Religious freedom is a God's gift to a hum human being. No government uh, anywhere around the world should interfere with one's uh, way of life, uh, or whatever the way, uh, however the way that person worships or have a spiritual life. The Chinese government is making a mistake by not only interfering uh, people's private lives and also cynicizing the uh, sanctimonious uh, and religious uh, spiritual life. They have been appointing their own uh, imams, uh, uh, religious leaders uh, all around the country. Uh, they, they are twisting the, uh, something so sanctimonious to a propaganda, uh, displaying Chinese leaders' pictures in the place of worship, uh, promoting uh, something called Xi Jinping ideology, trying to replace it with religious beliefs. So this is what should, that should be concerning about. As a country, um, uh, we are uh, defending uh, religious freedom, promoting religious freedom is on our genes. It is also in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. As one of the key players in international uh, diplomacy, uh, international economic uh, uh, world economy, China must uh, acknowledge that the status quo is, uh, is, uh, is not sustainable. They need to look into their own mistakes. A powerful government, a confident government, a healthy government knows how to access, assess their own policies as the way that we do here in this country. Uh, that does not show that you're weak, that shows that you're strong. So uh, they need to revisit uh, the repressive policies. Uh, even Chinese leader, uh, their revered leader said, wherever the oppression, there will be a rebel, a resistance. Uh, this is what their leader said. So they shouldn't be surprised that there's a resistance within the Tibetan community, within the Uyghur community, within the uh, Christian community. Uh, so this is natural. Uh, when you oppress, people resist. Uh, and, um, and the Chinese government should also give up this uh, notion that they will continue to buy out silence around the world uh, with their economic, uh, my, uh, my economic power uh, to um, discourage or pressure others to criticize China's human rights records. Tenzin, do you want to add anything to that question? Uh, you know, I agree with uh, Commissioner Turkel. And what I want to say is I want to put a challenge before the Communist China leadership. Uh, Tibetans, um, you know, in India who are living as refugees, they have complete freedom to practice their faith study. Indian government and people even fund them to teach them their Tibetan language you know, uh, to uh, help with the Tibetan monastery set up. So the Tibetan language and culture and religion are thriving in outside Tibet as refugees. So why can Tibetans inside Tibet in their own country can speak their language and practice their religion? Why can Uyghurs in the East Turkestan, you know, practice their faith freely? Why can Christians and Falun Gong in China can do the same thing? As many research studies have shown, that religious freedom is intimately connected with the security of the country. China cares about the security, but represses in all the religious faiths. Just recently, I think 50 plus experts at the United Nations called upon China for the religious repressions in Tibet and Xinjiang and many parts of China, you know? So if they are not careful in providing religious freedom, you know, to the Tibetans and all other faiths in China, this could in the long run cause the great chaos and uh, you know and it has already great distress among the uh, faith groups in china so they should watch out for their own benefit uh, it's better to give religious freedom as you know universal declaration of human rights says not an american idol it is uh, in the universal declaration of human rights and if everything is rosy in china let us all come and see things for ourselves you don't have to tell us what is going on 
We have eyes, ears, nose to smell, mouth to talk, and we can do that for you. If I may add uh, something, um, we can, we can um, while we are uh, calling Chinese government to reassess and revisit and change, uh, reform uh, their policies, repressive policies that has been correctly described as a genocidal policies, we should also um, use our freedom, uh, people who are free uh, to raise uh, the corporate America has a, a significant role in this. Uh, consumers have a significant role isn't it, in this. Uh, this, may, this is not the uh, case for the Tibetan people, at least as far as we know not, uh, yet, but the modern day slavery is back. Um, at least 83 brands that the consumers buying around the world uh, here at home and Europe elsewhere uh, believed to be produced by uh, Uyghur forced labor. Uh, so global supply chain, global economy has been polluted by the products produced by uh, the modern slaves, the Uyghurs, that has been uh, arriving to the stores. Uh, recently, uh, some of you may have been uh, aware, the baby pajamas made by uh, the Uyghurs in forced labor camps made to the shelves uh, in Costco. Um, so as a consumers, as a business community, uh, as free individuals, this, we need to do what we can do uh, to uh, promote religious freedom. I will speak for those who cannot speak for themselves in communist China. Yeah, thank you both for that. Uh, you know, I, 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 we touched a bit up on um, uh, the, the fact that Tibetan Buddhists are able to practice their religion outside of China, particularly in India and Nepal. And so we, we actually had a question about that I think ties into that. Um, uh, this person wanted to ask, what about the response of the South and Central Asian governments, uh, both on the treatment, Chinese treatment of Uyghurs and Tibetan Buddhists? Um, are those governments, have they shown any support for religious freedom? And if, if not, why not? Um, the Chinese government has um, created a false division uh, for oppression versus against oppression. Uh, and now it's like pro camp versus against camp. So um, there are uh, countries um, around the world uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, Central Asia, uh, Africa. Uh, I think the number is over 50 is literally debating against this notion that uh, China has a, a, a notion that China should not have concentration camps, should not use technology to surveil its population, should not destroy uh, religious practices purposefully, deliberately, systematically. So um, last summer there was, uh, there was a letter uh, by 22 Western countries plus Japan versus 50 uh, uh, countries, uh, China's client states. So that, that is still ongoing. Recently, uh, UN Human Rights Council um, with a large uh, China supported uh, membership also came up in defense of China's uh, policies. Um, so um, it, three things uh, come to mind uh, when addressing this issue, three C's, corrosive, corrupt, uh, um, coercive, uh, uh, methods that the Chinese have been using to, one, silence, uh, threat, bullying some weaker countries. And the other way is they buying out silence. So Central Asian countries being uh, politically uh, unstable, economically weak, uh, have been uh, 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 not only silent, but also supportive of the Chinese policies. Um, as you may know, uh, the Uyghurs share a uh, cultural, linguistic, historic background with those who live in the Eurasia continent, all the way from um, uh, Great Walls of China to um, the, the uh, 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 Eastern Europe. Uh, and yet uh, only Turkey uh, in a in the, uh, few occasions have uh, spoken out um, through the Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, about the ongoing crisis. Um, the, 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 the international community uh, need to realize that uh, what is happening in China against the Uyghurs, against the Tibetans, are crimes against humanity. 
the international community should not let the Chinese government uh, or Communist Party to continue to test the resolve of the international community, the uh, uh, um, conscience of the international community. Uh, their silence is a tacit approval of China's, uh, the China's crimes being committed against Tibetans and Uyghurs. Uh, some people say, well, we don't know. Uh, yes, that's what happens. We always find out after crime has been committed. You cannot commit, you cannot monitor when the crime has been committed because it's done secretly. So in order for you to stop it, you need to speak up. So um, the, uh, the Chinese money, China's economic support, uh, can be attractive to this, some countries, but in the long run, uh, they will be uh, uh, partly responsible for um, either willingly or unwittingly aiding the communist Chinese government's uh, repression of the Tibetans and the Uyghurs. Uh, uh, can I say something, Dominic? Oh, of uh, course. Yes, I agree with uh, you know Commissioner Turkle there. And what I want to emphasize here uh, for those who are listening to us today conversation is as we focus on Tibet, it seems like, uh, well, this is all with Tibet and some Uyghurs and like that. Uh, but we must realize that China has much grander and bigger plan uh, to occupy the whole world. Okay, Tibetans and Uyghurs have become the first victims of uh, Chinese operation now. Now, as we know, uh, that China, through the toxic loans, debt trap, and soft powers, infiltrated into the education system of the United States, into the Australian education systems. And uh, so in the countries like Nepal and uh, like uh, Pakistan, they give you so much money and support, and pretty much uh, they are playing to the music of the Chinese. Uh, in Nepal, there are about 20,000 Tibetans, uh, and their religious freedom are very much restricted. You know, I wish we could do a report on the religious freedom uh, conditions in Nepal in our USAP report, uh, uh, but we have limited resources and we couldn't do it. That China has signed repatriation treaty very secretly. First, openly they said no, Nepal didn't sign it, then secretly signed it. And that's a serious matter. And uh, so they have so much influence on the Nepali government that the 20,000 Tibetans in Nepal are under so much stress and operation, actually. They can practice at home, but they really couldn't practice openly like Tibetans in India could. So we must, all over the world should know that the Chinese soft powers are everywhere. Uh, and now what has happened to Tibet and uh, East Turkestan is happening to Hong Kong. Yeah, it's happened to many neighboring countries like uh, China is intruding into Ladakh and India, uh, starting a border issue with Bhutan, uh, and uh, like they have already included some of the Nepali territories into the map. So they have much grander plan. So if you think that Tibetans and Uyghurs are just crying here, it's not that. There's a much larger issue and the world must wake up and stand together and we must uh, subdue uh, China. Respect Chinese people, love Chinese people, but we must subdue and change communist leadership. Um, Dominic, if I may add something um, that just reminded me, um, we should also be very mindful. I'm glad that Dr. Dorji mentioned the, uh, the Hong Kong situation. Um, you know, those of us who've been working on human rights uh, 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 for a long time, been making the case that we gotta be careful. This is the beginning, this will how it ends. So this is one of the um, instances, um, I, I hate to say this, but I told you so no, uh, a moment. This, we, we kind of knew that this was coming because the Uyghurs and Tibetans have lived through this, uh, they, through the legislative process, the fake autonomy, the China has now created this open air prison like environment. So uh, Tibetans and Uyghurs live uh, in open, uh, open air prison like environment today. The, every aspect of life has been um, surveilled. Their religion, uh, their way of life is purposefully, deliberately, uh, systematically uh, targeted and in the process of being destroyed. And now look at what is happening in, in Hong Kong. Back in April, 2018, uh, Chinese uh, also, uh, excuse me, 2017, they put in place something called de-extremification measure through the local legislation, legislative uh, entity that paved the way for today's nightmare. I worry that uh, the, the new national security law 
uh, that just been in, uh, passed and enacted uh, would would bring same type same side of uh, same type of nightmare to the people in Hong Kong. And also, I'd like to use this opportunity to highlight something very significant. I I, I do a fair amount of public speaking, but whenever I, I talk about U.S. policy, uh, bipartisan support, um, I get pushed back by some uh, countries, reporters, who tend to be sympathetic to the communist Chinese state. The question is, or U.S., uh, the, the point that they try to make is that, oh, this is Trump administration's uh, attempt to hamper China rights or tackle China concern. Well, this is the United States, uh, this, this whole thing, this whole problem was created by the US government. No, it's not. The freedom of religion has traditionally been an important part of American values. American people care for freedom of religion. It is also enshrined in the First Amendment of the US Constitution. There is a law called the International Religious Freedom Act of 1998, which makes the religious freedom a key priority to the US foreign policy. And also US government believes that it has a moral responsibility to help people around the world, like Tibetans and Uyghurs, who should be able to practice their religion and should be protected under the international law. So, so this, this concept that the US is creating this problem to slow down China rise uh, it's just nonsense. Um, as, a, as a commission, you sort of believe that a robust uh, religious freedom, uh, re religious freedom protections enhances country's stability, security, development. So promoting religious freedom abroad makes sense strategically for this country. I think the, the countries like China and others should also look into it and, and try it. Religious freedom is good for the society. And as I pointed out, it makes your country much more stable and gives you the sense of security that they, you're trying to uh, achieve through your uh, uh, armed police, uh, riot police, uh, security cameras. Yeah, thank you both for that. I mean, I think the, um, you know, some, of the, some of the questions, and unfortunately we won't have time to get through too many more questions, but a lot of the questions that have echoed that the Chinese government and China as a country with a very rich history of, of different religions coexisting alongside each other. So I think we have time for one more quick question. And this one is about the importance of Tibetan, uh, the Tibetan language and culture and how that ties to religious freedom, but also if there's anything that um, the US government can do to preserve the Tibetan language, because as, as you both have said, it is under threat right now. Uh so I'll go first uh, with due respect to my uh, <laughs> uh, Commissioner Turkle there. Um, yes, um, Tibetan language, uh, you know, uh, is uh, very much restricted in Tibet. Uh, it's not taught in the schools. And if you speak it, you promote it, you can end up in jail like Tashi Wangju, you know, who advocated for linguistic freedom. And for us Tibetan, Tibetan language is not just a Tibetan language every day. If you want to know, the rich, holistic, complete teaching of uh, Buddhism, which came to in Tibet from India, today, as the Lama says, is preserved in the Tibetan language. So many universities across the world uh, who are doing serious Buddhist studies, they have Tibetan language program. Uh, and so in India, uh, you know, all Tibetan children can write and speak three languages, Tibetan, English, Hindi, or Kanara, or Malayalam, Telugu, Gujarati, whatever, you know, we are very rich in our linguistic traditions there, even as refugees, mind it, right? And uh, so I think what the United States government can do is always uh, provide funding uh, to uh, preserve and promote Tibetan language, especially now a lot, lot of Tibetans are in the United States. In our school systems, they don't teach Tibetan. So if there's a way that the US Congress administration can help, Tibetan Americans to learn their linguistic heritage and preserve their language, culture, and religion, uh, that, would, that is direly needed right now, and I strongly advocate for that. Great, thanks so much for that. And unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions today. Uh, I just wanna take a moment to thank you both, Tenzin and Nuri, for uh, taking the time to share your thoughts today and uh, for participating in this event. I think it's been a great opportunity just to shine light on some of these issues in China and to, to think about how we, how we try to make the situation better. 
Um, this is actually the first event we've had a HUSER between a former commissioner and a serving commissioner. Uh, I don't think it'll be the last. So if you're interested in USERF's work on China, I highly encourage you to check out our website. And in addition, keep an eye out for an event on July 27, uh, 22nd. We're planning on having a hearing about the Chinese government's use of surveillance technology to target religious communities, particularly Tibetans and Uyghurs and Christians. So uh, information about that will be on our website soon. Thank you again for joining us. And I hope you all have a good rest of the day. Thank you uh, very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you, Yusuf. Thank you, Dominic, Commissioner Turkel, and all, everybody who listened to in the end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, it's so nice to, uh, to have yes. this conversation with you. Uh, thank you very much.